as I was coming down. I was telling Liam, I was trying to get into my car. I live in Ballamoney, but I live in the middle of nowhere in Ballamoney. It's not even, well, it's a road. <laughs> but I was trying to get the car door open to get in, to come down here. And I thought, if it's like this in our driveway, what's it going to be like on the way down? The other thing I want you to observe is the size of the screen that you're looking at and the one that I'm trying to see my text on. And this could very well be a challenge for somebody who probably in not too long will need an extra uh, set of glasses, but we'll see how we get on. When I was coming down in the storm, I may have told you this story before, but the storm jogged my memory of another true story. I was invited to speak in Ardmore Gospel Hall and I got up to speak and I was sharing a few thoughts in Psalm 73. And that psalm is a beautiful psalm, a psalm of Asaph. And in the opening verse, it starts with these words, truly God is good. And I said to the folks in Ardmore, you know, I think the psalmist wrote that as verse number one. Because if you kind of hadn't time to read the rest of that psalm, you would have something to take home with you. And I said, you know, tonight, if the lights were to go out and we all had to go home and all I had time to say with you, truly God is good, wouldn't that be wonderful? The lights went out. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Honestly. And shining above the platform was this wee green emergency light. And I was squinting to try and find uh, Nori Emerson, who had invited me down. And I said, Nora, what do you keep doing? Or what do I do, rather? I said, he said, you keep preaching till the lights come on. <laughs> and so for the first five minutes, with a little green light, Maybe that's why my eyes are so bad. Um, I struggled, but we got through. And on the way out, this elderly lady, God lover, she took me by both hands. She says, that's brilliant. She says, I was waiting. I've been waiting all my life for that to happen. <laughs> and I, th well, I thought to myself, well, you have a very strange life if that made your life complete. But there you go. Hopefully that will not happen this evening. Now, this little dicky do doesn't... Oh, here we're talking now. The title of what I want to talk to you or share with you this evening is Where Are You Going? That was almost appropriate to me on the way down here because the Coast Guard had closed the coast road. And I seen this big blue light flashing and I thought, I don't know my way around here. So I decided to follow another car. Not always wise... But they sort of took me part of the way, then I stopped and I put on a sat-nav, which got me right to the door. But where are you going? Now, I'm sure we have all heard of this concept of a message in a bottle. Someone writes a message in a little bit of paper, puts it into a bottle, throws it into the ocean. And very often these messages can be carried for many, many days, weeks, months and miles and then someone finds it washed up in a distant shore and they open it up and whatever the message is they're able to read it a message in a bottle but I wonder if you ever heard of a message on a cup now that's really challenging your thinking but I'm going to explain to you my wife Lynn and I and our younger son Josh and his wife Beth at the beginning of September of this year, we were together and we had a lovely holiday on the outskirts of Dubrovnik. The day that we were coming home, we had to be up at four o'clock in the morning. Well, in actual fact, we had to be at the airport rather at four in the morning. So we were up just after three. We hadn't too far to travel. About 11 kilometers brought us to Dubrovnik airport. And we went down and we parked up our hire car and you put the keys through this letterbox, which meant you couldn't retrieve them after you'd done that. And in we went to the airport complex. But you know, when we went up to security, the girl said, where are you traveling? 
And I said Dublin, and her facial expression changed, and she went, no, you're not. And just as she said that, my son's phone pinged. And he says, Dad, we're going nowhere. I've just had an email from Ryanair. Our flight has been delayed. And the flight that should have taken off at 6 o'clock in the morning, they told us to come back at half one. Now, I'm grateful for my daughter-in-law, who is very good at lateral thinking. She said to us, the accommodation that we were in, we weren't meant to leave it until 10. She said, we can go back to the place where we were staying. Because we'd put the key into one of these uh, key boxes that you can open again. And then before I knew it, she was on the phone with Uber. And I, that's not a fella, by the way. That, that's a, that's a, a taxi service. And within minutes, we were back in the accommodation and we got our head down for a little while. But you know, the flight that was meant to take off at 6 o'clock, it didn't take off until 15.30. Now, you heard the expression, being fit to be tied. That was me. I, 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 my patience isn't great. And as I keep having more birthdays, my patience gets less and less. And my son... I don't know what he's on. Hopefully he's on nothing. But he's very <laughs> laid back. I often say, Josh, you're so laid back, your head's touching the ground. He's so laid back. He kept saying, Dad, chill out. Dad. Now, the more he said that, the more agitated <laughs> I became. But, of course, we got onto the flight. And as you probably know, a cup of tea sorts out all the problems in the world. Um, I was never so glad to see uh, the ladies and the gentlemen coming through the plane to serve a cup of tea. But you may guess my surprise when I looked at the cup. And now this is actually a photograph. And that is the wee table behind the seat in front of me. I took a photograph of the cup because I'd never seen this before. A message on the cup. Now, obviously that was in context of people flying and flying all around the world. And it was just simply an innocence asking the question, where are you going? Our journey, our homeward journey was from Dubrovnik to Dublin. But you know, as I looked at that cup, the Spirit of God spoke to me. And I thought, isn't that a most interesting question to ask people in context of the gospel? Where are you going? Where are you? Are you going? Now I'm not going to embarrass anyone tonight. And any questions that I asked. I want you just to. In the presence of God. Just to quietly answer those questions. In light of where you are. In terms of your life. And your spiritual journey. And so I took out a notebook. And for the balance of that flight home. I jotted down some thoughts that I want to share with you this evening. And my starting point was this. What does the Bible have to say about life? First of all, the Bible says that life is like a vapor. I was on another holiday. You may say your life's a holiday, boy. But... My wife Lynn and I celebrated 45 years of married life and we headed off last week down south of Kendall a little bit and we stayed just in a cottage and it was very chilled out. But you know, as I was standing making my, now listen gentlemen, making my wife a cup of tea, I got the recipe and I know how to do it. Um, I do, I do. She takes black tea too, so there's not a whole lot of ingredients go in. But you know, as I was standing in the wee kitchen area and the kettle was boiling, I was reminded again of this verse. When the kettle came to the boil, the steam came up and out of the funnel of the kettle. And I saw it for a moment. And then it was gone. My wife does not like me to talk like this, but I, I sometimes sit and talk to her about our age and how much we have lived and things like that. And Lynn will say to me, David, don't be talking about that. But it's a reality. And I thought to myself, 45 years of being married. 
and it's just like the click of a finger. I remember standing at the front of Fort William Gospel Hall and Brother Eddie Jemison saying that I had to repeat after him all of these words. I told the men in the prayer meeting I met Eddie years later. He came into the back of Bally Hackamore Gospel Hall and the brother said, do you know this man? He said to me and I says, he's the man that married my wife and I. So this man stood up and said, good to see you all. Good to see Brother Eddie Jemison. He holds a very special place in David's heart. So when I get up, I said, lovely to see you all and lovely to see Brother Ed. And I says, Ed, there's a question I've been dying to ask you. You know the way you got us to say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, when does the better bit start? (laughs) Now, people saw the funny side, but Ed didn't. (laughs) And if anybody knows Ed Jemison... (laughs) He said in a big gruff voice, it's well seeing your wife Lynn's not here or you wouldn't have said that. (laughs) There is a funny side of it, but there's a serious side of this too, folks, and it's this. From the moment we were married until now, five children later, five grandchildren later, it honestly feels just like the click of a finger. The brevity of life. It appears... For a little while, the Bible says, and then vanishes away. But you know, life is also like a story. It says in Psalm 90, it's like a tale that is told. When I was in school, I was always told that a good story has to have a beginning. And then the middle section And then to draw it all together, it has to have an end. And you know, your life and my life began when we were born. And probably there was joy in the family home when you came into the world and when I came into the world. And then there's a middle section. And none of us know how long that section is going to be. But then someday your life and my life, the last chapter of that will be written. And your life and my life, certainly down here, will be brought to an end. But you know, as I thought about where are you going, I began to think that there's also a sense in which your life and my life is like a journey. And so I sat down and I put these questions or these, yes, they are questions, together. And I want to ask and answer that in the balance of our time together. Now, when I go to Serbia to preach, one thing they told me off about was, I don't preach for long enough. (laughs) I think it's the reverse when you're in Northern Ireland. But as our brother said, once I've finished saying all that I have to say, We'll bring our meeting to a close. But where, from where to where, question mark. And then the second one is, what direction am I traveling in? Then the next question, what stage of my journey am I at? That's interesting. And then where is my final destination? And then finally, is it possible to change Direction. Now we're looking to the Spirit of God to help us as we look at these questions together. Where, from where rather, to where are you and I traveling? The Bible says that we're traveling from time out into eternity. Our journey began when we were born. You see, your life and my life They're bound by time. See, the God of the Bible, he's different to you and I. God is not confined by or defined by time. But you and I, we're creatures of time. Our lives are bound by and defined by time. You know what the problem is, though? None of us know how much time We've got left. Like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Like a story that is told and it's finished and it's over 
and gone. You see, one of the wisest men that ever lived, he penned those words. There is time for everything and a seizing for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. You know, I remember years ago in Fort William Gospel Hall, a man was asked a question by somebody who was on save. We used to do a teenager's meeting and we got folks who used to come in and they come in on their motorbikes and they come, come in on their scooters. There was the, the mods and other folks. I don't know what they were called. but And they each sat at one side of the hall. We often thought there was going to be a fight. But somebody was saying, how fast are we traveling at if our life is on a journey? Well, we're traveling at 60 seconds to the minute, 60 minutes to the hour, 24 hours to each day. And life is going on and going on and going on. If I was to stop speaking now, that clock will not stop. It keeps moving second upon second, minute upon minute, hour upon hour. But you know, whenever life for you and me ends, the reality is eternity Begin. Some will suggest that we live our lives and we die and that's it. But that's not what the Bible says. To me that would seem a rather pointless endeavor to live and to die and that's it. But the Bible says that we live and we die and then for us eternity begins. What direction am I Traveling on. You see the reality is. The Bible teaches us very clear. That the moment you and I were born. We were born with our face. Away from God. Our back towards God. And we were. Every day that we live. We move further and further. And further away from God. We're traveling. Effectively. In a wrong. Or the wrong Direction. The psalmist puts it like this. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We all know that verse from Isaiah 53. All we like sheep we have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his and her own way. And every day that you live. If you have not got God in your life. If you've never had your sins forgiven, if you've never been brought into the family of God, every day that you live, you travel further and further and further away from God. We had a man recently in our fellowship who gave his testimony and he had had such a troubled upbringing and such a difficult life, mainly because of wrong life choices that he made. And he said, he felt that actually, the reality of that, that every day he lived, he knew he was going further and further and further away from God to the point where he wondered, was there any hope for him? Could God ever save someone like him? His life was a shambles. And he knew it. And every day he got up, it just seemed to start again and went from bad even to worse. Here's an interesting question. What stage of life, of this journey of life rather, am I at? We, Lynn's mum and dad have passed away. My mum and dad have passed away. And we're the only uh, members, we're not looking for any pats in the back, but in our family that go to see the graves and keep the graves tidy and clean. But you know, when we go there, it's hard not to wander up and down where the, the lines of the graves. And you know, recently we did that. And I said to Lynn, look at that. Little children born and very shortly thereafter passing away. Little infants. And then there's others, they, they live right through to maybe 90. And some people beyond that.
Isaac said a very interesting thing back in the book of Genesis. He said, I know not the day of my death. You know, if people did know the day of their death, some would wait until the day before and try to get right with God. Try to put the thing right. But there's not any of us that know the day of our death. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. I seen recently on Instagram a message that really made me stop and think. It was a very challenging message and I want to share it with you in an abbreviated format of a can. Do you know in Ikea you get the paper measuring thing one meter long in centimeters obviously. And what this man did was he took that one meter tape that you get in Ikea. And he said look the likelihood of you living beyond 85. Now if you're nearly heading that direction don't be offended by what I'm going to say. But he said the likelihood of you being able to live beyond that is quite remote. So he tore off the last 15 centimeters off that measuring tape. And then he said tear off a centimeter for every year of your life. My goodness. We'd gone from 100 to 85. And then in my case if I'm spared to November the 16th I will be 69 I was born at a very early age. That's why I look so good (laughs) for 69. But that's the reality. 69. 85. Doesn't leave a lot. And what is left is the likely remaining years of your life. Can I tell you something? I had thought about that little video that I had saw. As I was coming back in the plane. And it really challenged me. That's why the psalmist says in that psalm. Teach us Lord. To number our days. That we might apply our heart. Unto wisdom. Somebody else said. For those who are saved. And I challenge you tonight. Only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus. Will last. Where is my final destination? Do you know the Bible only speaks about two destinations. People like to think about heaven and all the glories of heaven and the splendor of heaven and being in heaven. But the reality is that hell is a rather uncomfortable subject for most if not for all. And yet I was surprised to discover some time ago That the Lord Jesus spoke more about hell than any other writer or person in the scriptures. It's described as a place of eternal torment. Of unquenchable fire where people anguish in regret. From which there is no return. And here's a reality. And I say this carefully and I say it kindly because I'm going to have to give an account one day for what I say here from this platform. If you have not yet had your sins forgiven, the Bible says that you're traveling on a broad and crowded road that is taking you ultimately to destruction. The Bible describes people who have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. They are without God. They are without Christ. And therefore they're without hope. And that's why we come here this evening. That's why we sing these lovely hymns and choruses. That's why we share with you the good news that it is possible tonight. For you to stop. Going in a direction that's taking you every day further and further from God. With your back towards God. Your face away from God. To come tonight and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. So that he might take you off that broad and crowded road. And place you on that narrow road that leads to life. We make mention of this just now. And my final question, is it possible to change direction? And the 
great news that I have to share with you is yes, that's the gospel. It is possible for you, no matter how many years you have traveled in the journey of your life, no matter what you have done along those years of that journey, it is possible tonight for every one of us to turn. You know, there's a hymn that we used to sing at the close of a lot of meetings when I used to preach around different gospel halls. Oh, turn while the Savior in mercy is waiting and steer for the harbor light. For how do you know but your soul may be crossing over the dead line tonight? You know, here's the message of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world in order that he might save sinners. He went to Calvary's cross. And there in the three hours of darkness, God the Father punished his son, his sinless, spotless, holy son, for all the wrong things that you and I had done. He took that punishment. So you and I don't have to be punished. We can thank him for loving us, for dying for us. And the moment you do that, Something wonderful happens. He came to save us from our sin. To save us from eternal punishment. To save us for himself. He wants to save you. Not just from your sins. Sometimes we don't preach this dimension in the gospel. He wants to save us so that we will serve him. The best of all masters. I love that little chorus. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. A door that is open. And you may go in it. Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. And what he does, and I've said it already. The moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. He takes you off that broad and crowded road. And he places you on that narrow way that ultimately leads to eternal life. I remember the night that I got saved in Fort William Gospel Hall. And I went and spoke to a man and I said, I just want to let you know that about 10 to 8 this evening I trusted the Saviour. And here's what he said. David, I'm so glad that you shared that with me. He said, you can go home tonight and kneel down at the side of your bed and you can say Hello. To your heavenly father. That's what he actually said. And it was such joy to my heart. That I could now call God. My heavenly father. But he said another thing. And he says David you can lay your head on the pillow. And you know that all is well. Between you and God. Isn't it wonderful as a believer. Yes there are things that keep us awake. Problems within our families. Stresses and difficulties. And challenges. But in terms of salvation, we can say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So what does the Bible have to say, life? It talks about the brevity of life. It's just like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. It talks about the different stages of life, our beginning. And you and I had a wrong beginning, born in sin, shape and iniquity. That middle section, and no one knows how long it will be. But then ultimately the final chapter someday will be written for your life and for mine. We've tried to answer. We're traveling from time to eternity. If we're not saved, our back is towards God, our face is away from God. None of us know the day of our death. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're heading on that broad and crowded road that ultimately will take you to destruction. But it is possible to change tonight. Change direction by coming and trusting Christ as your saviour. I'm nearly finished. But I want to tell you this story. Harry Andrews shared this with us many, many years ago. And it stuck in my mind. The jester, for those who are younger might not understand what a jester is. Was somebody who would, his job was to cheer up the king and to make the king happy. And in a token of his appreciation, the king presented this gesture with a special scepter or rod or stick. And the king also set this gesture a challenge. He said, I want you to travel through the kingdom. And if you find somebody more foolish than yourself, 
when you find that person, I want you to give them this scepter. And so the gesture, he took up the challenge and he traveled for many days and that developed into a longer period, into many, many weeks. He met many people, but he was unable to find anyone more foolish than himself. And when he arrived back home, he was really saddened by the news that the king was very unwell and was likely to die. And he went to visit the king to see how he was and to tell him about his travels. The king was lying on the bed, but he was really glad to see his friend, the jester. And returning, sorry, referring rather to his illness and his very forthcoming death that was imminent, he said to the jester, Like you, I'm going on a journey, but unlike you, I'm not coming back. The gesture asked the king, have you made any preparation for your journey? And the king replied, no, I haven't made any preparation for my journey. And the jester took the special scepter and gave it to the king. And he said, you told me to give this scepter to the person who I think is more foolish than me. And he said, you're going on a journey. You're not coming back. And you've made no preparation. And he handed the scepter to the king. And he said clearly. You're more foolish. Than me. There's a very strong moral in that story. Dear friend in the meeting this evening. Your life's like a journey. I asked you at the beginning. Where are you going? Only you can answer that before God. But if you're still on that journey. And you've made no preparation for eternity. Well, then you're as foolish as this king who, although he knew he was going on a journey and he was referring to his death and he wouldn't be back, he had made no preparation. And so I finish my message this evening with the words of this little verse from the book of Amos 4 and verse 12. God says, the Bible says, not me, not the folks in the gospel hall, prepare to meet thy God. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the things that we have thought about this evening and this question, uh, where are we going? Father, we thank you for many in the hall who can look back to a time in the journey of their life whenever they stopped realizing themselves to be sinners, deserving the punishment of God, but realizing, Father, that you sent your Son to die for each one of us, to be punished in our room and in our stead in place of us. And by a look of faith to Calvary and simple childlike faith in the person and finished work of Christ, we've had our sins forgiven and all is well between us and God. Father, if there should be one person in the meeting this evening who has not made that choice or decision, We pray before this day comes to a close that they might prepare to meet their God. And so now we ask you to separate us with your blessing. Bring each of us home safely. We ask of you in your son's peerless and precious name. Amen. Thank you.